Welcome everybody to Pediatric Grand Rounds and wish you all Happy New Year. Hopefully we're gonna looking forward to a great 2024. I will start with our land acknowledgement. We'd like to acknowledge the Ramaytush Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramaytush Ohlone elders, past, present, and future who call this place the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramaytu Shaloni community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. And I would like to uh, turn it over now to our Vice Chair for Education, Sundrain Van Shaikh, to welcome everybody and introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Rafi. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker uh, for today, who is joining us remotely, um, invited by actually Dr. Ted Ruel, who uh, could not be here in person today. Um, and he was invited because uh, we were so clearly in need of getting an update on what's happening with re respiratory syncytial virus disease. Um, and uh, we were, I was like, Ted, you must know good um, good people who have a lot of expertise in this area. Um, and we didn't have anybody local, which Ted all blames on me, because uh, unbeknownst to not many people, but um, once upon a time, I actually did research in respiratory syncytial virus, and then I fell off the bench and started to do education work instead, because otherwise I might have been able to uh, give this talk. Who knows? Probably not. Um, looking at uh, Dr. Um, our, our invited speaker's uh, bio, I don't think I would ever have made it uh, to be that successful and develop the uh, expertise. So our speaker today is Dr. Octavio Ramillo. He is the chair of the Department of Infectious Diseases at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital um, in Memphis, Tennessee. He obtained his medical degree at the Universidad Compiotense in Madrid, Spain, and completed his pediatric residency at the hospital um, Mm, my Spanish, uh, de Octubre in Madrid, followed by a pediatric infectious disease fellowship and a postdoctoral research fellowship in immunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He previously served as chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Nationwide Children's Hospital and Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. He has been involved in translational and clinical research related to the role of the host immune response in pathogenesis of infectious diseases for over 30 years. And his current research is focused on the pathogenesis and treatment of respiratory infections, especially RSV, and the application of genomics and system analysis approaches for improving diagnosis and understanding of host responses to infectious agents and vaccines. And I had the honor of uh, reviewing his slides ahead of time. Um, and uh, I know that you're in for a, a treat because um, there's really a very wide a range of topics that he's going to cover uh, for us in the coming hour. So thank you for being here with us, uh, Dr. Ramillo. Um, let us hear about your work. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and the opportunity to join you this afternoon. Um, I would like to, obviously, there is always a good opportunity to talk about RSV, my favorite uh, topic of research and our group for quite some time. These are my disclosures. I would like to review briefly with you a recent epidemiologic changes in RSV and briefly about the acute, but also the long-term morbidity. I think the way we think about RSV has changed in the last decade. And I think it's important to consider that as we begin this new era of prevention. You will ask why we don't have the routine two-month vaccine for RSV. So I will focus some of our work to understand why it makes sense to do passive immunization instead of the traditional uh, active immunization at two, four, and six months for RSV, as we do for most other uh, pathogens that we provide vaccinations. And then I will dive uh, summarizing the recent data on how we can prevent RSV infection in young infants through maternal vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. I touch just for a couple of words on the vaccines for the elderly, but obviously that's not my area of expertise. Last winter, I never saw as many uh, notice on the papers or on TV about RSV and the importance of 
how bad a pathogen it is for the young children. Obviously, all of us who work on pediatrics have, uh, we know that every season we have to deal with a tremendous influx of patients coming to the ED, to the practices and to the hospital with RSV sometimes. Uh, and I work in a large hospital all my life. The, even the ED uh, are totally overwhelmed with the kids that we don't have enough beds to be admitted to the ICU because of RSV. So that's nothing new for us, but maybe it was for the lay public. But it's important to, to remember that RSV is a major pathogen globally. Indeed, this paper changed the perception of RSV. It was published more than a decade ago, and they did a nice summary of trying to understand where are the major causes of childhood death. And it seems like uh, the data was really relevant because in the first year of life, as you can see here, right after malaria, RSV was the second most common cause of death. Uh, obviously, most of this occurs in low middle income countries, but this translates in our environment with uh, huge numbers of hospitalizations and visits to the emergency department, to the clinic. In the middle of the pandemic, uh, because probably the non-pharmacologic non interventions, there was a totally total change in the normal epidemic of RSV. You can see here that before the pandemic, in the 1920, we have the usual peak around early uh, winter until the early spring in 2019 to 20, but the year 2021, RSV was almost gone to reappear a little bit in the, in the summer of last season. So that's interesting. And now we are catching up. If we look at the more recent data from the CDC, and I download this data a week ago, you see that we are now, if this is December, and overall, this is different in each part of the country a little bit, but you see the overall seems like we are going back to the traditional uh, early winter, uh, early spring seasonality for RSV. Now, I would like to share with you our experience when I was in Ohio at Nationwide for the last few years and how we, we saw these changes. You can see that we saw every year between 1,500 and 2,000 kids, but even before the pandemic, you can see there in the 2019, 20, 20 season, there was already some alterations and some increased cases of circulation. This was mostly RSVD during the summer uh, that we never saw before. And we have a very careful approach uh, following the epidemiology, of, the epidemiology of RSV. Now it came the pandemic, there was no, almost, almost no RSV. And here we plot uh, the COVID-19 cases in the line, the dark blue and the RSV cases in the light blue boxes. Um, the COVID uh, cases are in the thousands and the RSV are in the hundreds. And you can see that obviously there was a tremendous change. First, when the Wuhan came, there was no RSV. But then when the D Delta wave came, we, we could experience a simultaneous uh, circulation of RSV and COVID. And then Omicron came, disappeared again, and then came back again last uh, uh, year. And now again with a normal seasonality. Now, during these periods, we have two opportunities to document co-infections. One during the Delta RSV co-circulation and then the second with the Omicron and RSV. It was so low, the number of co-infections. We were projecting more in the 10 to 25% based on our experience with the endemic coronaviruses. But despite that the numbers being low, the cases were clearly associated with understand how different viruses shape the immunity and early immune development in life. Just a couple of uh, reminders about the structure of the virus. Um, it's a small, single-stranded, negative-sense RNA virus. It has only 10 genes that encode for 11 proteins. There are three that I think we all need to remember. The G protein, the glycoprotein G, which is the attachment protein that allows the virus to attach to the respiratory epithelium. The F of fusion protein, because allows the virus to fuse with the cell membrane so the RNA can be incorporated into the host cell. And this is much more conserved and it's been the target of most of the vaccines and monoclonal antibodies as we'll see in a minute. 
And finally, there's NX1, non-structural gene one. This is a very important gene because it really modulates the ability of RSV to block the immune response. And that's why we are not very effective in protecting against RSV, and especially in young children to develop good antibody response and good memory. That's why kids get reinfected during their first few years of life. Here we have the structure. The resolution of the structure of the RSV fusion protein was really a seminal discovery by Jason McClellan and Barney Graham and Peter Kwon at the NIH a few years ago, because this dramatically changed our ability to produce vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. We knew the structure of the post-fusion RSVF. You can see it here. Uh, but look how different it is in the natural. Um, you can see the ways really the structure of the molecule in the surface of the virus, which is very metastable. But you see that this discovery opened up this resolution of these sites, site zero, site five, and, and uh, as new sites that induce very potent uh, neutralizing antibodies. And that was the base, the basis for um, discovery and, and development of new vaccines and monoclonals. G, the fusion protein, as you can see here, this is a model, it's not been resolved yet by uh, my friends from uh, Ohio State, Mark Peoples and Will Ray. You see it's heavily glycosylated, which is uh, really a challenge. But despite that, we can see that some of the antibodies against RSVG can be protective. So I don't think the, the jury is completely out that RSVG cannot be another component of an RSV vaccine. We all know that when we look at hospitalizations in the US, in Europe, in, in parts of the world where the data has been generated for decades, we see a very similar pattern. The majority of the children who develop severe RSV and end up in the hospital are in the first six months of life. We know this. This is a classic paper by Carolyn Hall, the mother of RSV clinical research, uh, a few years ago with a network of collaborators all over the US. Look at this, how the peak of severity in the US is the first month of life. Whether this is related to the lack of uh, pre uh, um, daycare or maternity leave is a very interesting discussion because you see this peak usually move a little bit to the right in European countries where probably uh, maternity leave is more pronounced. This is pure speculation. I don't think we know that for sure. What is consistent nevertheless is that the majority of the hospitalizations occur in the first six months. However, if we just focus on the acute infection, on the acute bronchiolitis, I think we are gonna miss a lot of the morbidity associated with RSV. I want to talk for a couple of minutes about that. Whenever we think about RSV, we need to think beyond bronchiolitis. And there are two important areas to focus. One, the very well recognized post RSV wheezing, recurrent wheezing and chronic airway disease. Uh, mechanistically, there is a lot of debate, but it's clearly that there is a strong association, whether it's only on kids that are already predisposed because they have a smaller airway or a genetic predisposition, or those normal kids in whom RSV causes major disease and chronic airway disease needs to be sorted out. Personally, I feel that RSV causes damage. In some kids represent maybe 20 or 30% of the damage that leads to recurrent wheezing and chronic airway disease, but in others represents probably 90% of the damage. But the other aspect that probably we have not paid much attention until recently is this new perspective on the RSV bacterial interaction. And I want to spend a little bit more time on that. Just going back to the wheezing and chronic airway disease, this is one of many studies. This is one that we did in our, in our center with my colleague, Dr. Mejias. We review a big databases of 125,000 kids, half of them with diagnosis of RSV in the first year of life and half of those who did not. And based on a, a administrative and insurance database, we were able to follow what happened with these kids for the next five years. And as you can see, it was a dramatic impact. Having a diagnosis of RSV in the first year of life was associated to a those who were medicated. 
this is very important, I think. And it's something that will require for us to pay attention as we introduce the new monoclonals and the new maternal vaccines, we expect to see an impact also on not only on the acute disease, but also on the recurrent within an asthma. And I think it will be important to collect and to perform carefully uh, controlled studies on this asthma. However, I would like to talk on this new perspective on RSV and bacterial involvement. Traditionally, we always been taught that if you have influenza, you are very likely to develop super infection with staph aureus or pneumococcus, but that with RSV, that's very rare. However, new data suggests that that's not the case. So we decided to study this carefully, and we have done two important studies in our area when in Columbus. We did look at the presence of potential pathogenic bacteria, the uh, gram-positive pneumococcus and staph aureus, and the gram-negative H. flu and moraxella. And for that, we use a PCR obtaining samples from the MP swabs from these kids with RSV. For, the, for 10 years, we enrolled 800 kids. Of them, 681 had RSV, and we have 161 H match healthy controls. And as you can see, we have a large proportion of inpatients and a smaller proportion of outpatients. So we could compare out with inpatient. And obviously, we also have a bunch of them in the ICU and uh, another larger proportion in the world, which is what we usually saw in the last decade, right? Approximately. 25% of the kids who get hospitalized end up in the ICU. First, we look at the presence of fever, and then we look at the different groups. The kids who have a negative PCR, those who have staph aureus, pneumococcus, H flu, moraxella, and more than one pathogen detected by PCR. Again, all these kids have RSV, and then we classify them according to the bacteria that we detect in the nasopharynx using a quantitative PCR. And you can see that if the kids with RSV have pneumococcus or H flu detected in the nasopharynx, they were much more likely to have fever. Also, they were much more likely to have neutrophilia in the CBC, suggesting that there's a small hint that the kids that have certain bacteria in the nasopharynx are clinically a little bit different than the rest who don't. Then we use a score that we have developed, my colleague Asun Mejia has developed and we have used for the last decade to look at disease severity. And we compare here the kids who have nor pneumococcus nor H flu, either pneumococcus or H flu or both. As you can see, the disease severity score goes high, higher with one of them and even worse with both of them. Again, subtle differences. One is on fever, the second is on neutrophilia, and the third is on disease severity. Even if we focus on the sickest children who are in the ICU and we correlate the bacterial load of pneumococcus versus the duration of the PQ stay, you can see there is a direct correlation suggesting that, yes, these bacteria that we detect in the nasopharynx are causing some changes and, and causing some changes are causing some changes in the um, disease severity. Another big piece of information talking about this interaction between RSV and pneumococcus came from this study published by Rhonda Gann and colleagues a few months ago in Israel. They have been studying pneumococcus for quite some time and very carefully. They have a very strict criteria to define bacterial pneumonia, pneumococcal bacteremia, and pneumococcal invasive disease with very, very uh, contrasted data for over a decade. During the pandemic, which is in red, compared to the previous years in blue, you could see that during the winter months, there was a disappearance of the community alveolar pneumonia and the pneumo pneumococcal bacteremic pneumonia. It, so what they call community alveolar pneumonia is mostly pneumococcus, but they saw a decrease on that and a decrease in the bacterial, uh, sorry, the pneumonia caused by bacteremic pneumococcus with uh, positive blood culture. So really dramatic. Then they went on and they look at what happened with the pneumococcal colonization. And again, because they have this tremendous database for the last 10 years, they were able to look if the kids, the percentage of colonization during the previous years and before the pandemic in blue versus the pandemic, it did not change. So there was not pneumonia and there was not pneumococcal bacteremic pneumonia, despite the fact that the kids 
have um, been colonized and we can detect the pneumococcus in the throat. They look at the viruses and they demonstrated in red the disappearance of RSV and influenza. And with very nice um, statistical analysis that we show in the paper, they demonstrate that the lack of circulation of respiratory virus, mostly RSV, influenza, and pneumococcus. of pneumococcus and uh, pneumonia. So it's really, really another very interesting uh, evidence that the interaction between pneumococcus and bacteria is real and RSV and pneumococcus, sorry, RSV and bacteria is real and especially with pneumococcus. Our group has been very interested in understanding how RSV uh, alters immune response. So for that, we have uh, relied on analysis of transcriptomics as a tool to link disease pathogenesis with the clinical findings. Our hypothesis is that each child with his or her own DNA genotype with some host factors, age, uh, nutrition, uh, maybe some subtle immune defects in the context of the environment, you know, temperature, humidity, um, smoke contamination, the microbiome, we have data about that, and other factors, this patient gets exposed to the virus. And that means that certain genes are gonna be expressed or suppressed. So our hypothesis is that by looking at the genes that are being expressed, so not just to the library of all the genome, but the, the books that are open and being read, we can understand better the pathogenesis and we can go back and understand the process that caused the disease, right? We can reconstruct uh, the pathogenesis of the disease. Now, but we also want to link this with the clinical disease phenotype. So we can, we would like to propose that the mRNA could be the perfect link between disease pathogenesis and clinical disease manifestation. And it's a very good tool to study how RSV pathogenesis evolves over time by age, and also as we begin new interventions. This is a first type that we did in Dallas, uh, as you can see, a decade ago. Here we compare the healthy controls versus RSV. Each of these columns is one kit one patient, and each of these row is one transcript or one gene. You can see that despite the fact that RSV does not cause viremia, it causes a tremendous disruption of the gene expression patterns in the blood with 2,000 genes differentially expressed. Those are suppressed look blue, and those who have enhanced expression are in red. You can see big difference with the healthy controls that came by reproducing a second cohort and in a very consistent way, we have been able to reproduce in Finland and in Ohio. Now, if we classify now the kids according to the severity, you see that the healthy controls versus the mild, moderate, and severe disease show some difference in the profile. You can see that some of the genes which are reddish here become very red in the severe, and some of the blueish are very suppressed in the severe cases. So these genes that are part of the transcriptional profile induced by RSV infection change according to severity. And as you can see, we can use a score called MDTH, or molecular distance to health score, to quantify all the genes that are abnormally, but significantly different, significantly different differentially expressed, significant differentially expressed, sorry. And you can see when we calculate this score, it goes up as the patients get sicker. And not only that, we can correlate with the clinical findings. In this plot, we can plot here the genomic scores, MBTH scores, versus the clinical disease severity score. So how we uh, assess the kid. Is he having tachypnea? Is he having retractions? Where is the O2 sat? And we can see that by using this genomic score derived from a transcriptome in the blood, correlates perfectly well with the respiratory distress. And also when we measure the score and admission, correlates with the length of hospitalization and with days of supplemental oxygen. To me, it's remarkable that the immune system can provide us so much information about the disease, right? It can tell us if a kid has RSV and the severity and even capture something that you don't expect in the blood about the respiratory distress. So we were very encouraged because we can now begin to connect disease pathogenesis with 
disease manifestations in a way that allow us to understand RSV disease better. So now we learn how to use the transcriptome, how we can apply this in the context of this viral bacteria interaction that I was mentioning earlier. To do this, we got the kits, we have all RSV, and we took the transcriptome according to the bacterial detected in the nasopharynx. As you can see, are very different. If the kids, all of them have RSV, and if they are, if we detect H flu or pneumococcus, you can see that the number of genes that are abnormal is still pretty high, much higher than if you have coronary bacterium or axella or staph aureus. That means that even the presence of that bacteria in the nasopharynx, that someone in the past we used to think is colonization or passive, is not that passive because. We saw earlier in the other study there was some subtle changes in the clinical manifestations. And now we see that those changes are associated also with dramatic changes in the immune response at the transcriptional level. classify the type of genes according to the elements or the components of the immune system. Here we have the five groups, H flu, Streptococcus, Coronavacterium, Moraxella, and Staphylococcus, according to the bacteria detected in the nasopharynx. When we look at the interferon genes, all the groups have a very similar response. But when we look at the inflammation genes, we saw that those associated with H flu or Streptococci have a much more active activation of inflammation genes, and also, when we look at the adaptive immune response, we see a much more dramatic suppression of the T cell responses. This is not uncommon. When we do transcriptional analysis of acute bacterial infection, it's not uncommon to see a suppression of the adaptive immune response, probably because the neutrophils and the monocytes and macrophages are highly activated. But what is unique is the fact that the inflammatory genes are much more expressed in kids that have detection of pneumococcus or or uh, H flu in the nasopharynx. Again, if we put all this information together and we look at disease severity, we see that the kids with detection of H flu or Streptococcus have much more disease severity. So two different cohorts with two different approaches confirm the same findings, that the detection of uh, bacteria is associated at changes in the immune response with some subtle changes in the clinical disease severity, or not so subtle. As you all know, after 60 years, finally we are seeing the light. We are beginning to have adequate and effective tools to prevent RSV. Until now, we were very limited to the high risk population using palibizumab. But now we are beginning to have strategies to reach all children, the whole birth cohort in these early months of life. This is the, the path. Path is a NGO organization based in Seattle that uh, follows very carefully all the developments in RSV prevention. And this is the, the, the chart of all the different vaccines and monoclonals in, uh, in developing are approved for prevention of RSV. You can see that we have now, in terms of monoclonals, we have now a palivismab, the, the typical synergies that we have known for two decades, the new prolonged half-life monoclonal nisevimab, we have two vaccines for the uh, older adults, one from uh, Glaxo and one from Pfizer and the maternal vaccine from, from Pfizer. And, and, and you can see that Moderna is coming along with a mRNA-based vaccine also now initially for adults, but also they are now beginning to go into the pediatric as well as the new monoclonal from Merck. So there is really a tremendous excitement in the field. After so many frustrating years, I think we are beginning to to look at really, really effective strategies. Let me summarize briefly for you. But for, before we uh, start that, I, I was uh, mentioning why we do not vaccinate kids with RSV with a traditional active immunization at two, four, and six months of age. And I want to talk on two aspects. One is the innate immunity, and the other is the maternal antibodies. Going back to our cartoon of the transcriptomics and the impact of severity, we saw the impact of bacteria. 
what about the impact of age? So it took us a while because we need to recruit enough kids to have kids with severe disease that are a bit older and kids with milder disease uh, despite being very young. So to be able to dissect and separate mild disease versus severe disease and young age, less than six months versus uh, more than six months. So it took us a while. So here, finally, we were able to analyze a cohort of kids with severe disease in patients in green and other patients in, in pink in the first six months of life and second, the six to 24 months of life. Now I'm gonna show you the transcriptome in a spider uh, graph. That means here we have the different elements of the groups of genes according to the component of the immune system. The obvious first observation is that the kids hospitalized with severe RSV disease have increased expression of monocytes, but especially of inflammation genes. So inflammation, as you saw in those uh, heat maps that I showed before, is associated with severe disease. The surprise was when we look at the interferon, the antiviral pathways. So there was no difference between those kids who were managed as outpatients and those who were managed as inpatients. However, when we look at the older kids, six to 24 months, the picture changed. Again, the severe cases hospitalized with severe RSV disease, huge overexpression of inflammation genes, and also even neutrophil genes that are not so separated from inflammation genes. But the big difference is when we focus on the outpatient with mild disease. We could see that after six months, the interferon kicks in and this is protected. So this is very important. RSV disease is very different if you have less than six months and after six months, because the interferon responses don't seem to work really. It to cause severe disease in these young children. First, the interferon response is not adequate. Second, they have a smaller weight. And third, they have no other protection, right? So uh, they are extremely susceptible to this infection. What about maternal antibodies? Well, here we begin to measure uh, antibodies against the pre-F, post-F, and RSV proteins using recombinant proteins. As you can see, the most abundance are the pre-F, Antibodies, but they drop very, very fast. You see, by two months, two and a half months, they are almost gone. So we are not surprised in that the level of protection by natural immunity is really inconsistent. Very important. Now, do they protect a little bit against severe disease? They do. Uh, is that adequate? No. That's why we, we need better tools. We need monoclonals. We need maternal vaccines. But the most important detail here is what happened when the kids get infected? Do they develop good and antibody response? So this is still unpublished. Here we analyze more than 200 kids by age, less than one month, one to two, two to three, and five to 18. And we measure the antibodies in the serum at three time points. In the acute time, so maternal antibodies, one month later and six months later. As you can see, the response in, in kids is not very good until more than five to six months. So again, matching the interferon observation. It seems like the kids, although the maternal antibodies decline very fast, their ability to make a good antibody response does not kick in until five, six months of age. Again, suggesting that maybe uh, active vaccination is not the best strategy. No interferon that protects the kids against the acute infection and, and, uh, and also um, not a great ability to make good antibodies. Also, interferon, in addition to the component on the on the um, on the innate immunity, also in protecting against uh, acute disease, also favors the B cell function and the antibody response. So we now have experience, uh, and they have important developments in the RSV vaccines for adults. I'm not going to talk too much, but you should know that we have uh, RSV pre-F based on the structure of the pre-F molecule. The, the Pfizer vaccine has a B and A component, so it's a bivalent vaccine. The Glaxo is also an RSV pre-F with uh, the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, uh, Glaxo adjuvant, and Moderna has a mRNA vaccine. Uh, um, uh, Janssen make a adenovirus uh, vaccine with uh, 
recombinant protein, by, although it showed very good data, more than 80% protection, they abandoned the development of, of this vaccine. So overall, this is a summary that Unfolse made in one of the RSV meeting earlier this year. Uh, they saw very low rates of severe events, and all these vaccines are effective against both lower respiratory tract infection and acute respiratory infections. They are very well tolerated, but it's important that they tested in very healthy populations with very few people over 80 years. The percentage of uh, efficacy against lower respiratory tract illness with more than three symptoms is in the more than 80%. So really encouraged, really encouraged after so many years of trying to develop good vaccines for us. We first, we see vaccines with an effectiveness, the efficacy actually more than 80%. What about inputs? Okay, so I'm gonna talk uh, in the last uh, uh, 10, 12 minutes about the maternal vaccines, about the new monoclonal antibodies. Let's talk first about the maternal vaccine. This is the phase two study published in the New England Journal a year and a half ago. Here you see the maternal participants and the antibody titers, and here the infants. Here, this line corresponds to the neutralizing activity that they target based on the palivismab experience, both in the moms and in the babies. And they compare two doses of vaccine, 120 versus 240, and they compare with alum or without alum, you know? And it's very interesting because you can see there was not an advantage of using a higher dose in terms of immunogenicity or using alum. Not only that, when they look at the transplacental antibody ratio, they notice that the vaccine without alum have a better ratio of crossing the placenta than that with alum, you know? So good uh, transplacental transfer, good immunogenicity, well tolerated and good antibodies, both neutralized antibodies, both in the mom and the children. So the company decided to use the 120 uh, formulation without alumin. And that's the one that was tested in the phase three trial, the, Ma the Matisse trial, as you know, has been published in the New England Journal, more than 7,000 participants in eight different countries, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the uh, RSV pre -F vaccine because it has 60 micrograms of the RSVA and 60 micrograms of the RSVB pre-F uh, protein, right? Uh, or placebo. They tested in, in women 24 to 36 with gestation. And this is the day. If you look at medically attended LRTI, so not severe, not so uh, uh, strict criteria, the efficacy is around the 50%, 56%. Again, this is very, very important and very exciting. It's the first time that we see a vaccine that works to prevent RSV disease in young children. Now, in the US, there's been a, bit, a lot of debate about the, the whether to recommend the vaccine 24 to to 36 weeks or using a more strict um, uh, recommendation because there has been some potential concern about some prematurity that has not been uh, totally defined, but I'll be happy to talk in detail during the Q&A. If we focus on the same vaccine between 32 and 36 weeks, this is data that I downloaded yesterday from the FDA um, bird pack meeting in May, you can see the efficacy is even higher uh, you see that uh, in the severe disease, 91%, and in the um, milder disease, uh, um, uh, 75%. So it's interesting that obviously the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that we can prevent at three months, 90%, at six months, 76%, if you focus on that group, is encouraging, uh, but I, it's very unfortunate that the, the recommendation was so limited because it limits the ability to, to recommend the vaccine beyond or before 32 weeks. I would say, and this is uh, my personal perspective, is that in Europe, the vaccine has been approved for uh, 24 weeks, right? And I think that's an important detail between the EMEA and the FDA approval. What about monoclonals? You all remember palivizumab. Palivizumab is a humanized mouse monoclonal antibody against RSVF. And it's important to realize that although the molecule is mainly humanized, 
the binding site, it was developed against a mouse monoclonal. The second generation mono, uh, monoclonal was Motavizumab. I, we were very involved in this development, but unfortunately did not reach approval by the FDA, although it was more potent than Palivizumab because there was some concern about skin reactions that, you know, there's no consensus if they were really concerning or not about the, the skin expert and allergy. But now we have the new monoclonals. The, the two, one, Mircevimab, developed by AstraZeneca and Sanofi, already in the market, and Tesrovimab, developed by Merck. They are very different than Motavizumab and Palivizumab. Number one, they are human monoclonals, so we're totally developed from a human uh, B cell. Second, they bind the pre-F, the pre-F sites, and we'll review them in a minute, from the, the pre-fusion form of the of the F protein, that means that they have much more potent neutralizing activity. One is that they are more potent. And second, they introduce the YT mutation in the FC region that uh, confers a very prolonged half-life. So the monoclonals, the new monoclonals, Nisevimab and Clersonovimab, have two different characteristics. Number one is this target, the binding on the PF protein. And second, the ability to have this prolonged half-life due to the um, the FC region. It's interesting that if I make this jest, uh, Zoom makes a, a, a hand there like I'm uh, trying to do that. This is the structure of the pre-fusion form of the RSV F protein. You can see how the different uh, antigenic sites correspond to different neutralizing activity from red to blue. Site zero is the target of the SEBI map or the, the new monoclonal already in the market. Subtabumab was a monoclonal developed by uh, Regeneron that uh, failed in clinical trials against, I'll be happy to talk later, uh, site five. Site two, which is present in both the pre-F and post-F, is the site for palivizumab, and clesrovimab is directed against site four. This is the data published in the New England Journal about the efficacy of uh, one dose of nisevimab against uh, RSV disease uh, through five months. Here we have the medically attended RSV LRTI, an efficacy of 76%. You have seen this being published in the Indian Journal against hospitalization, similar and in very severe patients. You see this has already been published and is very well recognized. Very impressive results, even better than some anticipated. There's a very recent study, real life in um, open, uh, conducted in Europe that was published in the New England just now. And they compare the SEBI map in 4,000 kids, mostly England, Germany, and France versus no intervention against hospitalization. Again, real life, but hospitalization as the target. And the efficacy was dramatic in the more than 80% uh, against hospitalization, confirming the, the randomized classic clinical trial. Let's rub him up. Uh, is in development, it's still early. We don't, I have not seen phase three data. Maybe there is, but I have not seen it. It's real and it can be done targeting different epitopes, and it's, it's really a, a, an exciting uh, new development for prevention of RSV in the whole uh, infant, not only the, the premature and the high-risk kids, but in the term babies with only one dose. So I think it's important that we rethink the way how we can approach or how we can use the monoclonals for RSV prevention. We used to think on palivizumab, one monoclonal that has to be given five times during the season, in a very targeted population. The new monoclonals with high potency and prone half-life, and these are the original names of Nisevimab and Clesrovimab, is one dose, and the idea is to reach all kids, premature and term babies, high risk and normal healthy newborns. And uh, Spain, the, in the northwest of Spain, Galicia, uh, I have good friends there, they began to implement this SEBI map. Spain did a, a major effort in the last three years to get ready, and they start uh, implementing this SEBI map in most of the country in October. Galicia started even the first week of September. And here you see the 
in the hospitalizations in kids less than six months in Galicia. And you can see from the, the 2017 to the 22, 23, the different peaks of, of hospitalization. And this is the current season with 90% implementation of the SEBI map in, in that region. I know the, the group very well, so I'm sure that we will continue to see if the data holds on because this beginning of the season is, is quite exciting. The ultimate goal for us who care about pediatrics and children is to prevent and to protect all kids against RLP. It's important to think about what this means because the birth cohort is quite large. In the US, we have 4 million kids being born every year, in Europe another five. China has 17 million. And India, which is the number one country in terms of births in the world, has 25 million. Altogether, it's 140 million. So until we can get RSV prevention with our maternal vaccine monoclonals, we have a big target there, 140 million newborns. That's what we need to do and what we need to think about, how we can make sure that these uh, fantastic tools, these fantastic preventive strategies can reach all of those babies so we can decrease the mortality, the tremendous morbidity associated with RSV. What is going to be the difference? You know, we have two fantastic tools, the monoclonal antibodies and the maternal vaccines. A lot of people ask me, what is the best option? I think both. We need both. And yes, we need both. And I think different groups, different societies, as we learn more about them, they are going to focus on this. Uh, the, the decision is going to be based on the cost or price, which might not be different. The different funding mechanisms of different countries or regions. We still need local surveillance and epidemiology and where these uh, vaccines and monoclonals are going to be given in the hospital, in a clinic. You know, in the U.S., it's a big challenge to give monoclonals before discharge, the, the way we reimburse for delivery compared to Europe, which is not a problem, and how we target the different age groups. So I think there's a long way to go, but this is just the beginning. And for the first time, we have really, really wonderful tools to begin to approach our strategies to prevent RSV in the whole, whole birth cohort. In summary, I hope I convince you that RSV causes major morbidity and mortality in young children worldwide, that young infants have an, an inadequate interferon expression and limited ability to make a good antibody response against RSV, that the maternal vaccines and the high extended half-life monoclonal antibodies represent uh, a great and attractive strategy um, to prevent RSV in young infants, but we still need more studies to see the impact of RSV prevention on the acute and the long-term outcomes. And we need to monitor the seasonality, the sequence variation, the impact against all uh, different age groups. And we need new tools and new vaccines to prevent disease in the older infants and young children, as well as immunocompromised hosts. I just want to thank a lot of my colleagues, especially my close uh, colleague for the last uh, 15 years, Dr. Mejias, most of this work started at uh, Nationwide, and now we moved a year ago to St. Jude and was funded mostly by the NIH and some intramural grants, as well as some big, big uh, large, uh, non-investigative uh, um, initiated grant from Janssen. I'll be very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Uh, while people uh, put their, their questions in the Q&A on Zoom, I'm going to see if there's any questions here in the audience. I'll, I'll start with asking a question. Um, and this, I have not seen any data, but you may have. But anecdotally, um, after the pandemic, we didn't only see a big surge in RSV cases, but we also saw an increase um, in older kids getting very severe RSV disease. Has that been described in the population that's getting monoclonal antibodies? I, I apologize. It seems like we lost the internet connection. Yeah, for we that. Had a Can you sure. please repeat the Sorry, question? Again. Yeah, repeat. Um, so, again, I don't know if there's data on this, but anecdotally, we have not only seen an increase in the number of RSV cases immediately after the pandemic, uh, as a total number, but we've also seen a shift 
in uh, older kid, kids getting more uh, disease. Have you seen or has that been described with the monoclonal antibodies that are given at an early age? Does that shift some of the disease burden to an older age? Well, that's a really, very, very important question. It's true that with the pandemic, we saw a little bit of a shift uh, towards uh, older kids. And um, my colleague who likes EPI is finalizing some of the analysis on that. But I think it's important to realize that the pandemic and the use of monoclonals is very different because the monoclonals, during the pandemic, there was no circulation, no exposure. Now, with the monoclonals, the kids are being exposed to the virus. And we have data that the kids, even with the monoclonal, and no disease develop antibodies against the virus that are not in the monoclonal, so against uh, targets like POST-F or G. So the kids are being infected. So they are being primed and they are seeing the virus. And the original data that has been done, very limited so far, does not show that there is an enhanced disease in the second season. We did not see that either with uh, palipsmab. But obviously it's something that we need to monitor and, and, and watch closely, right? Um, I, I totally agree. But I think it's important to realize that it's, we are not going to decrease the circulation of the RSV because of the monoclonals or the vaccines like we did during the pandemic. It's a very, very different situation. I'm convinced, furthermore, that the, the vaccines and the monoclonals do not cause sterilizing immunity. So the kids are going to get infected, but they are going to be protected against severe disease. In your future directions, kind of the need for studying vaccines in infants and, and young children, I was just wondering if you could comment on uh, whether or not that's kind of already started and, and how... Yes, how yes there is some. That. No, no, it's, it's a very good question because I'm always pushing this for this for quite some time. Sure. At least there is, um, I heard two, two pieces of information. One is that the live attenuated vaccine, similar to... Um, to Flumis, uh, LIAB, that we have for influenza, there is a, a couple of companies developing, and one is very advanced. Uh, is These vaccines were developed initially at NIH by Peter Collins and, and, and Ruth Caron and others, and now Sanofi took over those vaccines maybe uh, two, three years ago, and they are going to go to phase three this, this uh, 24. So it's very good news on that, because half of the hospitalizations occur in kids uh, older than six months. So it's very important. And, and you know, we know that the kids who go to the uh, emergency room, the clinics, there's still a large population in the first two, three years of life. That's number one. And then Moderna also wants to develop the mRNA vaccine. They, they, what I see, I heard, is that they are going back down in ages. So eventually they will, lead, they will reach that group also with an mRNA strategy. And I don't know, maybe even Pfizer with the vaccine may go down in that age group. Uh, that's also been discussed, I believe. So I'm very optimistic in there. I don't think we have any further questions. So um, we're going to end a little early, but thanking you for a really, uh, great presentation and a fantastic update on everything we need to know about our experience. So I, I appreciate the invitation so much. I'm sorry that sometimes online it's difficult to, to do things the same way because I don't see a pace. <laughs> and, the, and the pace, maybe I was very fast. Um, I hope I didn't get anybody too confused. And um, thank you again for the invitation. No worries. I think it was pretty clear. Next time we'll just have to get you over here in uh, visit San Francisco with us. Have a good rest thank of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.